Okay, you are ready because I have the have the screen set and we are recording. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Scott Len, and uh, just a little background on me. I have been a student or a, or studying the Civilian Conservation Corps for going on almost thirty years now. My granddad was in the CCC, and of course, that piqued my interest um, originally. Um, I've always been interested in the camps and the work that they did and, and all the things that you see around the United States that are attributed to the Civilian Conservation Corps. So when I moved to Southport, um, or we bought our house about 10 years ago, I was quite excited to learn that there was a camp in town. And then even more excited later on when I started doing some research to find out, as Bob said, that my, my house actually sits right on the edge of where the camp was. And um, we'll see that in a little bit but let's talk just a little bit about um the civilian conservation corps i assume that everybody here has at least a a little bit of knowledge about it but just to review the civilian conservation corps was started in 1933 it was one of the programs that uh franklin roosevelt instituted immediately upon um taking office uh he had tried a, a program similar to that when he was governor of New York, he actually had unemployed men work on his Hyde Park estate um, and put them to work and paid them and let them earn a wage. So he thought that when he became president that this was a good way to help get uh, America out of the depression was by putting these young guys to work. I'm gonna go, uh, try not to make this very technical at all, but I'm gonna start out with kind of a timeline because it's really pretty remarkable in that you know, FDR was uh, sworn in as president on March the 4th, 1933. On March the 9th, he called in the head of the Department of the Army and several other uh, government organizations and proposed his, his uh, emergency conservation work, as it was first known. On March 31st, he signed the Federal Unemployment Relief Act into law and um, by April the 5th, they already had 25,000 men signed up. So the first camp opened on April 17th, which was Camp Roosevelt, which opened in Edinburgh, Virginia. And the first guys walked in. So when you think of that timeline from March the 4th, the day he took the oath of office to April 17th, when the first 200 men marched into the woods to start work, it really is a remarkable thing. And when you think about it in the context of of uh, today's politics and today's you know government work and it, it's just unbelievable that that happened um, by july just a few months later there were over 34,000 enrollees in 172 camps in 35 states around the country so his goal was to put young men back to work and he certainly did that and one of those camps although it didn't open until a little bit later was our camp camp sapona here in southport um, up at the top of the slide, you'll see there, the camp designation was P62. The P stood for public. This was kind of an unusual camp in that the work that it did was, uh, I said public, private, actually. Most of the work that was done was done on private land. Uh, most of you that are familiar with the Civilian Conservation Corps and the stuff that survives, it's in state parks and national parks and national forests and so on. But most of the work that these guys did was on private land. And the company number was Company 427. And Company 427 was formed in June of 1933, so very early in the program. But they originally went down to Georgia. They were in Hiawassee, Georgia area and worked down there for a year before they moved up here to Southport, Lock, Stock, and Barrel. So that's kind of the background. Bob, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, Let's just talk for just a second about the Civilian Conservation Corps in North Carolina before we zero in on Southport. So the program ran from 1933 to 1942. And then of course the war came along and, and all these young men went off and joined the military and, and money appropriations became a problem and things like that. But it was a nine year program. And during those nine years, there was an average of, of about 45 camps in any given year in the state of North Carolina. 75,000 North Carolina, North Carolina men um, were employed by the Civilian Conservation Corps. And um, I'm not gonna read all of these off, but one of the things that I wanna point out is um, between the pay and the money that went into building these camps and the, and the money that went into the communities because these camps were located there, um, 
it was about $1.46 billion were pumped into the economy in North Carolina through the Civilian Conservation Corps. And we'll talk a little bit more about that and how it affected Southport later. Um, all these, the work accomplishments, I won't go over, but you can see they planted a heck of a lot of trees. They built a lot of, of, of bridges and roads and improved forest stands and things like that. So it had a tremendous economic impact, not just on um, you know, the country as a whole, but also on the state of North Carolina, and then to a smaller extent, the town of Southport. So off we go. Bob, next slide. So where was the camp? So if, this, is a, this is a modern photo. It's about seven years old now. This is an aerial photo from 2013 off of Google Earth. And if you look right in the center of the photo, you'll see a dot. That dot is my house. That's the center of the universe for this talk right here. And just to get your bearings, the yellow line just to the left of the dot, that's Leonard Street. You can see the tennis courts from Low White Park there. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Um, you see the tennis courts there, uh, Dozier Hospital up in the upper left-hand corner. And then um, Northwood Cemetery is the big open spot there kind of at two o'clock from the dot in the center of the the photo. So this is the area that we're going to be talking about where the camp was located. Back in 1934, this obviously was the edge of nowhere in Southport. You know, town pretty much ended at Atlantic, uh, and this was a wooded area, which I only recently learned. I don't know the exact, um, you know, relationship, but it was owned by a Dosher. Um, a Richard Dosher, I believe was his name, um, who owned this wooded area. So now let's take a flashback in time. Bob, if you hit the next slide. This is an aerial photograph from April 1938, which shows the camp. Um, the camp actually closed in December 1937. Um, but very fortunate for me, several years ago, I, I walked into Mary Strickland's office and she had this huge aerial photograph of, that was taken to Southport in April of 1938. And as we'll see later, um, thankfully there was some drama about disassembling the camp after the uh, camp closed. And so all the buildings and stuff were still there when this aerial photo was taken. So this is, this is the camp um, as it was in um, April of 1938. And of course, through the course of the time that it was here in town from 1934 to 1937. If again, we look at the, the line going through the center, that is Leonard Street, which used to be the main road uh, to Wilmington. Uh, on the left-hand side was the main camp area and the area that we're looking at there, um, those thin white lines or the overlay that I did from Google Earth, uh, you'll see 8th Street and that's actually Memory Lane, which is just off of 8th Street. Oh, come on, my mister. I'm sorry? I heard somebody say something. I think they were <clears throat> accidentally on. Oh, okay. So the camp, the main camp area actually straddles what is now Memory Lane, just off at of 8th Street over there. On the other side of Leonard Street, where I've got it marked as the Forest Service area, this was where the work buildings were. This is where the, the Forest Service offices were, the, the motor pool, which is that uh, cleared area just to the southwest of the big open area which is the new cemetery area and then um, the camp gate I've circled there right as it uh, across Leonard what is now Leonard Street and you can still see that bullseye dot again that's my house which is center right field of the town ball field right there um, the ball field was actually built by the the enrollees at the camp and then after the camp closed, you know, a lot of people might remember it as the town ball field, which was there till I understand about the mid 1950s. Uh, I was told that it went away right about the time Hazel hit. It had nothing to do with Hazel. Um, it just, the timeline was about the same. So um, that's physically where the camp was located. Now, one of the things that I'd like to point out about the camp before we move on is this was very unusual. If you do research of the of the thousands, there were, at, you know, overall there was over 4,000 camps um, in the United States through the course of the program. Not many of them were on the edge of town. 
And one of the advantages that these guys had was they could, at the end of their work day, they could walk into town, they could go to the theater, they could chase girls in town, they could go down to the waterfront, they could go get a, a ice cream at Watson's Pharmacy. Um, this was very unusual. Most of these camps were out in, you know, basically the middle of nowhere. And if you were lucky on a Saturday, they'd load a truck up and take you into town for a few hours. So um, these guys in Southport really had it made. Bob? This was a photo that was given to me just recently or sent to me by Katherine Kalmanson. I don't know if she's on today, but she was the granddaughter of one of the the gentleman there, LeDrew Sellers, and um, she's also the daughter of uh, Susie Carson Sellers. Um, this photo, I don't know the exact angle it was taken of uh, or from. I suspect it was from near the area of what is now Leonard Street, looking into the corner of the camp area. I believe that building to the left is probably the mess hall. If you look at the big wood box behind it, and all the smoke coming out of the um, chimneys there and the way it's laid out. Um, I believe that was probably the mess hall for the enrollees. And just to circle back a little bit, typical camp, and I say typical because it wasn't always uh, up to full strength, but a typical camp was 200 enrollees and about 40 overhead between the Department of the Army personnel and um, you know, the, the local experience men and the foresters and things like that did it. So about 250 people were taken care of in this camp. Next. So one of the biggest questions that we have, and in fact, just this morning, we had another one is, you know, how do I know if my father, grandfather, uncle, or whoever was in a camp? Um, one of the things you need to know about the enrollees in the CCC is that they enrolled for a six month enrollment. Typically enrollments were done in April and October. Um, and then an enrollee signed up for that hitch for six months. They could extend if they wished um, beyond that. Um, but it really makes it tough to track down individuals sometimes because when rosters are done, whether it be, and this picture is from the district annual 1936 um, that was put out, um, or, you know, maybe they listed everybody in the camp in the Christmas meal program. It's really just a snapshot in time. And um, if it happened that your relative or, or whoever was there at a time when they compiled this list, um, you know, you can track it down. But the fact that they're not listed in one of these doesn't necessarily mean that they weren't there or couldn't have been there because um, they may have just missed that slot when the, the list was compiled. But anyway, neither here nor there. Um, this is from 1936 from the District A, um, manual District A encompass most of North Carolina in the fourth core area. Um, if you look at these names, and I know you can't read them on there, this morning I asked Bob to post them on the Susie Carson Research Room list if you want to go look at the names. Um, but these are all the guys that were here at the camp at that particular moment. Um, by 1936, most of the enrollees in Camp Sapona were from North Carolina. Um, if you look at the original list when they first came, obviously most of them were from Georgia, and a few of them stayed. Um, you know, they stayed on as leaders or whatever, but by this time, by 1936, they're almost all North Carolina boys, and um, a lot of them are local boys, you know, from Southport, Shalot, Ash, uh, places like that. If we go to the next slide, this is the only other roster I have. This was printed in the Stateport Pilot in April of 1937, and this is the list of enrollees at that time. Again, both this picture and the previous picture I've asked Bob to put up. I'm not a local local, I didn't grow up here, but even I recognize a large number of these names as being local names, names like Harrelson and McKeithen and, um, you know, McGlamory and, and Hewitt, and, and these are all local names. Um, another unusual thing about the Southport camp is that uh, most of the guys did come from the local area. I was telling Bob and Liz earlier, in the case of my grandfather, he was from Ohio and was actually sent to Utah to work. 
Um, unlike that, uh, here guys were, were enrolled in the program and sent directly to camp here. So there's a lot of local names and a lot of local guys that were involved in it. We go on to the next one. Oh. So let's talk a little bit more about the camp. So if we, if we think back to that aerial photo, uh, this is the camp side. And on the camp side would be where the mess hall was, the barracks were, the administration offices, and, and all of that. This side of the camp was run by the Department of the Army. The way the, the Civilian Conservation Corps was set up, all the administrative details were run by the Department of the Army. And the reason they did that was not because it was a militarized um, organization, but because at that time, the Army or the, um, the Department of Defense, you know, or the War Department, as it was called at the time, was the only organization in the United States government that had the resources to pull this thing off. So the entire administration, the day-to-day the -day running of the camp, taking care of the health and welfare, the feeding of all the enrollees was run by uh, the War Department. And so the camp side, where all this is on the, on the west side of Leonard Street, um, was administered by the Army. And again, if you uh, think back uh, to the aerial photo, the barracks buildings actually straddled what is now memory lane. If you take a ride over there and, and take a look. We go to the next slide. This is another picture of the entrance to the camp. And on the right hand side, I find this interesting because in this photo, um, and you may not be able to see it very well, in the camp newspaper, they actually talked about erecting this sign at the entrance to the camp. And if you look very, very, very closely um, at the photo on the left, you can just see the outline of the, um, of the archway where the sign was put. Um, there you go, thanks, Bob. But yeah, there's, there's the archway. And then if you see the drawing that was done in the, in the paper, uh, the camp paper on the right hand side of this photo, you know, it shows it there. Um, again, this, the road in front of you that you're looking at is probably Leonard Street with the turn off into the camp on the west hand side. Next slide. Now across the street from there is where the forestry and work buildings and the motor, pe motor pool was. Um, this is where this side of the camp is where all the, the, uh, the work was organized and taken, taken from. I said that the Department of the Army ran the camp side. They did all the administrative stuff. Depending on the camp, and in the case here, it was the North Carolina Forest Service ran the work that the guys did. Um, they administered this side of the camp. So over here was the motor pool where they had all the vehicles that they used to take the guys to the work projects. This is where the forestry office was. This is where the, to the tool shed was. Um, and interestingly enough, this lot, if you look at the picture on the right, uh, this is a little bit of an older photo. There's now a house back there on Mitchell Street back in the back corner. But um, this open lot is still an open lot for the most part. And my backyard backs up to, um, you know, the sort of faces Herring Street. And I have actually found old tools and stuff in my backyard. I found an old pry bar and some old um, vehicle multi wrenches and things like that. So I suspect that from the tool shed or the motor pool, if something broke, they chucked it into the woods, which is now my backyard. And I've actually found a few, few pieces of iron back there. So yeah, this is the corner of Herring and Leonard if you wanna go, go take a look. Next slide. And here's a layout. There was actually a camp report I was able to obtain from National Archives uh, that was done. If we look at this drawing on the right um, and then the picture that's down in the lower left-hand corner, along the top margin, that would be Leonard Street and the left margin would be what is now Herring. And then you can see there the forestry office, the tool house and the blacksmith shop, the motor pool, um, which is on the other side of the creek, which is no longer there. It's now in conduit under, underground. Um, but 
where the motor pool is is probably where Mitchell Street and Herring Street, between Herring and the backside of Northwood Cemetery was that uh, cleared area where the motor pool was. Uh, interestingly enough, looking at taking a closer look at that aerial photo, there used to be a, a dirt road that ran from that point to the end of Brown Street where old that old Southport development is now. So they must have built a bridge across Bonnets Creek um, to get across there, but you can clearly see it on the aerial photo. Next slide. I'm trying to move along, Bob, because we don't want to be here at dinner time. Um, this is not a picture of Camp Sapona or the motor pool here, but it's, it's representative of what you would have seen at any of these camps. Um, the motor pool was really the bread and butter of the camp because, as we'll see in a few slides further on, the, the range of ground that these guys covered to do their work was pretty far and wide. And the motor pool was incredibly important, not only for, um, you know, things like the road graders and stuff that they used to do the construction, but for all the trucks and that, um, that they needed to get the guys out to work and back every day. And in addition to that, a big part of the Civilian Conservation Corps pro program was education. And a heck of a lot of young men, you know, learned to be mechanics and stuff, working in these motor pools, um, uh, working on these trucks and keeping them running so that they could do it. a lot of, of occupational uh, therapy was going on at the same time as the work that was being done. So in the case of Southport, that's okay. That's all right. Um, this is a picture of one of the trucks. Uh, this is a local picture. The gentleman that you see standing over there by the gas pump is kind of a famous member of the camp. Um, uh, his nickname was Fats, Fats Marr. Uh, he ended up being one of the senior leaders in the um, program, and you'll see his, his picture pop up quite a few times. The interesting thing about this, this truck is, if you look at the door of it, it says US ECW. So this is a very early truck because it's still stenciled with the US emergency conservation work, which is what the Civilian Conservation Corps program was called for probably the first six months of the program was um, ECW rather than CCC. So, next slide. So, State Forest Service and the LEMs. LEM stood for Local Experienced Men. And um, the day-to-day the -day work that these guys did in our case with this particular camp was run by the North Carolina Forest Service. Um, for the, a lot of the other things that were done um, were, were handled by local experienced men, which were hired from the local community. So if you think back to that very second slide that we talked about in, in the injection of money and jobs into the economy, these CCC camps really had an impact beyond the 200 enrollees that were there. Um, in a typical camp, um, you know, the, as we used to say in the military, the TONE, the table organization, called for up to 22 local experienced men. That wasn't always the case. They don't, didn't always have that full amount. But, um, you know, you'd have maybe 15, 20 guys hired from the local community to work at the camp. They might be helping the cooks. They might be teaching um, a trade like carpentry or something like that. So it, it em provided employment to local men um, as well who weren't necessarily enrollees in the Civilian Conservation Corps. And here we see a picture of um, the state foresters uh, that were here running the work out of the camp. Um, an interesting side note, I was reading one of the national uh, reports of the CCC for, I can't remember what year, maybe 36 or 37 or maybe even 38. But they said that the employment of foresters in the United States was at 100%, which meant that every professional forester in the United States, um, either through some other job or through the Civilian Conservation Corps, had worked. And when you think about this being the middle of the Depression, you know, that's just another success story that rolled out of the CCC program was it put all these guys to work. Um, next slide. So the company junior leaders, the junior leaders were actually enrollees. These were guys who maybe um, 
they showed some leadership potential or they were on their second enrollment, you know, they, they had completed their first, uh, their first enrollment, stayed on, um, took on leadership roles. Um, these were guys that, you know, kept an eye on the newer guys, the younger guys and stuff. This was a highly desirable position, not just because of the additional responsibility that you had, but you also earned a little extra money. And you got to remember, these guys earned a dollar a day. They got paid $30 a month, of which $25 they had to send home to their parents um, or their designated dependent. Um, by being a junior leader, you earned an extra six bucks a month, which was a little more money in your pocket to spend down at Watson's or at the movies. Um, you know, if you were able to wrangle yourself a girl to take to the movies. So uh, being a junior leader was kind of a big deal at this time. Go to the next slide. And this is the mess hall crew. So I personally can't imagine it, but actually not just in Camp Sapona, but in all of the CCC camps, the sweetest job these guys had was to work in the mess hall. And again, I think we have to look through it through the prism of, of the depression. When most of these guys came in, you know, they didn't know where their next meal was coming from, you know, things were destitute. And here all of a sudden they were being fed three hearty meals a day. And for some of these guys to learn to be a cook was, you know, that was the pinnacle of what they could do. Um, so this was a highly desirable position was to be on the, cook, the mess hall crew. Um, later on when the war started, um, as I noted in the text, a lot of these guys went on to become cooks in the military and they bypassed a lot of the training and jumped up a little bit in rank in that um, because of the skills that they had learned in the Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, food was a big deal. It was a big, big deal in these camps. And I have seen dozens and dozens and dozens of uh, memoirs where it really said, you know, for the first time in my life, I had more food than I, you know, knew what I could do with. I got three meals a day. And the average enrollee during his first six month enrollment gained 12 pounds um, just from having regular meals at that time. So we can't underestimate the power of, of, of food. And then just before we go on, just the economics of it, you have to understand that while some of the supplies to feed these 200 and some guys that were here at Camp Sapona came from, you know, probably from Fort Bragg, from general stores, a lot of it was um, purchased locally. So a lot of local farmers and stuff also were making a living off of this camp by selling fruits and vegetables and, and things like that to the camp. Um, and so it's that ripple effect of the economic benefits of having a camp in your, in your town um, that just rippled out and magnified far beyond the, you know, the 200 enrollees that were working there at the time. Bob? So the whole concept was based around, um, you know, these guys going out and work. And I mentioned earlier that the Camp P-62 here in Southport was a little uh, different in that uh, most of the work was done on private land. Um, if we go around the country, all of us have seen in state parks and national parks and national forests, we've seen picnic shelters and lodges and and things that were built in these parks by civilians. We've all been touched by them. We've all seen them. Um, that's unfortunately not the case here with, uh, with Camp Sapona because most of the work was done on private land. There's no legacy. There's nothing left of the camp. And there's also really nothing left of the work that they did that you would recognize. Um, but these guys were not worked every day. They worked a regular eight to four day. Um, they'd get up, they'd be trucked to the work site um, work ended at 4 p.m. They were back in camp. Um, after, after they cleaned up and had dinner, um, they could participate in education, which we'll talk about in a, in a little bit. Or again, because they were lucky guys here in Southport, like all of us, they could walk down to the waterfront or walk to the pharmacy or go to the movies and stuff like that. Interestingly enough, with these two photos that are here, the only person that I have an ID on, if you look at the photo on the left above the cab, um, you'll see a dog. That's Soapy, the camp dog. And that's the only positive ID that I have of anybody in any of these photographs um, from the camp. But Soapy was kind of a celebrity, so he was easy to pick out. 
the next. This is another photo that was given to me by Catherine Kalmanson um, of a work crew. Um, her grandfather, LeDrew Sellers, is the gentleman that's the second from the right. Um, I don't know who any of the other, the other fellows are. Um, presumably they were either out uh, doing some work or getting ready to go out and do some work. The gentleman on the far right is one of the, one of the foresters and you'll perhaps recognize him from the, the photograph that we had earlier. Um, but you know, here they are getting ready. I suspect that they're bridge building. The guy's holding a, um, a large drill there and we'll see a picture later of them working on a bridge. Um, and I suspect that this photo was taken about the same time. Go next. Another big part of camp life was, um, was the sports and leisure aspect. If you go back, if you go to the Susie Carson Research Room Library, which now has a link to all the old state port pilots, um, and you read through the, the rivalry between Camp Sapona and the town boys, whether it was be baseball, basketball, uh, tennis, um, was, was pretty stringent. And so um, they were always playing games. Um, the camp teams would travel to other CCC camps uh, throughout the area, or they would travel up to Wilmington to play teams, and it was really a big deal for these guys to um, participate in, in the team sports. If we look at the picture on the left, the baseball team, the coach is that Fats Marr who was standing by the truck uh, earlier. And the only fellow that I can recognize in the picture on the right, that's Mac McGlamory in the center of the, of the basketball photo. Um, not the guy sitting in front, but the, yeah, that, that gentleman right there. And of course, we all know that Mac ran Mac's Cafe. Um, that would is now Oliver's down on the waterfront. Next photo. Education. This actually is an excerpt of the educational program that was put on at at Camp Sapona. This is from this camp. Of all the things that these enrollees could participate in, FDR's, um, uh, you know, aim through the Civilian Conservation Corps was not only to get work done, but also to build the character of the young men that were enrolled in the Civilian Conservation Corps program. We can all think back, you know, our, our grandparents or, or parents perhaps, you know, not everybody graduated from high school, not everybody, and certainly not everybody went to college. Um, these guys came in, maybe they only had an eighth grade education like my grandfather did. They could earn a high school diploma. There were, there were academic courses, there were occupational courses. They could learn carpentry, they could learn blacksmithing, they could learn to be a mechanic, they could learn, um, anything um, that there was an interest in. Every camp was assigned what they called an educational advisor and they would um, either form a class um, of, that was of particular interest to the guys and if they didn't have somebody to teach it, again, they would go into the town and they might get one of the local teachers to come out to the camp several nights a week and teach a class. You cannot over emphasize um, this sort of tangential benefit of the Civilian Conservation Corps. So many of these guys learn their life's occupation from the time that they spent as young men in the Civilian Conservation Corps. And this was just, like I said, this is an example of just what was offered at this particular camp. And it's really pretty remarkable. So we'll go to the next slide. So one of the things that Camp Sapona was known for was its wood shop and its blacksmith shop. Um, it was actually one of the few camps in the area that had a blacksmith shop. Um, so that was kind of unique. Um, most camps did have a wood shop where they taught carpentry and basic carpentry skills to these guys. This picture that you see on the right, this was from uh, the camp was asked to put on an exhibit up in Wilmington. Um, at a store up there of some of the things that were produced in, um, in the camp. And, you know, you can see the standard is a pretty high quality. Bob, put your arrow back right where it just was. There's a stool there on the ground. This is just a little side story. Um, several years ago, um, it's this, go to the stool just to the right of that. 
the short one. There you go. Several years ago, um, when I first started doing the research on this camp, I was interviewing a gentleman by the name of uh, Roger Ward. His father, Jimmy Ward, was a member of the camp. And I talked with him on several occasions, and we were talking about it. And I showed him this photograph and, um, in the annual. And he got up out of his chair, and he walked over to the corner of the, where he was, and he picked up that stool. His dad had made that stool. And um, he said, I still have it. It's right here. So, I mean, to actually, you know, see the picture and then hold the stool in my hands was really kind of a neat moment. Um, you know, sadly, Mr. Uh, Ward just passed away just a few months ago, but um, it, I was really fortunate to get a chance to talk to him um, while he was here. Um, next slide. So talking about the work that the guys in the camp did, and this is, the, this is from that inspection report that was done um, outlining some of the work. And I, I really haven't talked too specifically about the work that they did yet, but here we go. If you drive um, from here up to Wilmington and you take 133, what we call, you know, River Road up to Wilmington, when you get up into the Orton land up there around uh, Orton and Brunswick Town and that, Many of those dirt roads that you see going off into the woods to your left there primarily were roads that were pushed through and made by the members of Camp Sapona. Um, we can see them up there. The one that I can tell you for sure, um, 100% is if right after you pass Orton and just before you get to Brunswick Town, there's a road. It's actually got a street sign on it called Telegraph Road. That was pushed through by the members of the camp. Um, and it's called Telegraph Road because it tied in the telephone network between the fire tower at Orton Pond and the one, the Mako fire tower, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. Um, they pushed through these roads. They were originally meant to provide access to this land, um, but the secondary and ultimately most important one was they served as fire breaks um, through this wooded area. Um, we'll talk a little bit about it a couple slides further, but forest fires actually used to be a very huge problem um, here in Brunswick County. And um, it was a safety issue. And that's why they were, even though they were working on private land and the private owners, the Sprunt family, the Orton family, undoubtedly benefited personally by having the work done on their land. It was for the public good. And that's how it was, how it was justified in the greater scheme of things that these P camps did work on private land, but it was for the public good. So um, the other thing that's interesting to note is if you look at this, the work ranged, you know, basically from here in Southport, all the way up to, um, you know, the edge of Wilmington, Leland, seven, the 74, 76 corridor, out as far west as Route 17 and beyond. Um, they had spike camps out in the Green Swamp and as far as, um, uh, well, not Winnebo, but um, what's the big lake out there? Um, oh. Yeah, Waccamaw, Lake Waccamaw out there. Thank you, Bob. And then um, as far south as probably Calabash. So uh, they really ranged far and wide to do the work that they did. We'll go to the next slide. And here's just some examples of the roads that were built. They pushed these roads through the woods um, again, these are uh, the ones that survive are the ones that you see off of 133 or 17, the dirt roads going into the private land. Um, they pushed them through. You'll see in the lower two pictures, you'll see the telegraph lines um, that they laid to link up the fire towers that were in the area. Um, once they pushed them through, they turned them over to the state. The state didn't maintain them, as you can see, which is what this inspection report was. And they reverted to primarily being um, fire breaks, which was you know, still a good thing. But um, uh, you see that the, the ruts and the stuff in the road were caused by logging. You know, that was the benefit that went to the private land. These guys gave access to some of this land so that the private landowners could get back there. It was an unintended be benefit for them. Um, but, you know, overall, it was for the public good that they did this work. And that's why they, why they did it. Go to the next slide. Just a few more pictures of, of roads and uh, the telegraph lines. They also pushed a lot of bridges or built a lot of bridges out. And I think on the next slide, 
um, Bob, uh, if we go, go ahead and go to that. This is another photo from uh, Catherine uh, Commonson who sent us this picture. And this is a corduroy bridge that they're laying across a swampy area or a creek to gain access uh, to the woods in there. So I mean, this was hard backbreaking labor, but you know, it was, it was kept the guys occupied and they earned a living or not a living, but they earned some money. And um, it was for the, for the benefit of, of all of us. And, and in this particular case, the, the landowners as well. Go to the next slide. Now I, I've got several slides on these fire towers. Um, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on them. I'm watching the clock here. Um, the reason that I focused on these fire towers are these are the only things left in the area that we can see today that were built by the members of Camp Sapona. There's four fire towers in the area that were built by members of the camp. Um, these air motor uh, 99 footers are pretty ubiquitous around the United States. Um, what's amazing to me though is that uh, so many of them were put up by CCC camps across the country in, in forests and parks and things like that. But the fact that they're still standing 85 years later after somebody you know, took a bunch of young, basically young kids, young men and said, you know, we're gonna build this tower. And I guarantee you none of them had any experience doing it. And yet 85 years later, here they all are. So um, this is the first one. Um, this is the Shalot Tower. It's located on, if you take Whiteville Road out of Shalot, headed towards Whiteville, you'll see it there on your left, still there. Go to the next slide. Um, this is the Mako Tower, which is, if you take Mako Road out to where you hit 70, 74, make a left, it's about a mile down the road there on your left-hand side. Tower's still there. There's a before and after photo that I took. Um, next slide. Jones Lake Fire Tower out in Bladen County, still there, um, also built by the members of Camp Sapona. And then the last uh, tower slide is the Bolivia Tower, which is probably the one we're all the most familiar with. The guys didn't actually build this tower. This tower was built in 1929 by the North Carolina Forest Service, but they built the residence and the building at the, at the base of it. Um, and again, it's been modified somewhat, but the structure is, is still there. I find it interesting that, um, you know, when I've talked to the guys in the North Carolina Forest Service, they still use these towers. People don't sit up in them anymore, um, but uh, they still use them as radio towers and things like that. And they're still sturdy. And, they're, and again, it just amazes me that they're still there, um, you know, put together by a bunch of young kids 85 years ago, and they're still there. But I, I put them in the presentation here, not just as an example of the work that they did, but these are the only relics of the camp and the work that the guys did, you know, other than a sand road through the woods uh, that you can still see today. Next slide. Um, I mentioned firefighting, uh, obviously logging, and, um, and that was a big industry uh, back in the 30s. Wildfires broke out every day. If you go look through old issues of the Stateport Pilot through the 30s, um, they fought multiple fires every year uh, throughout the area. The guys from Camp Sapona ranged as far as Lake Waccamaw out in the Green Swamp um, fighting these fires um, in conjunction with, uh, you know, the local communities and stuff. And they spent, um, you know, days and, and tens of days fighting some of these fires to get them out. You go to the next one. Um, again, these are just some articles that were taken out of the paper. Um, just an interesting side note, I was talking to the district forester a couple years ago and, you know, I was talking about all the old fires, he says, uh, that they had back in the 30s. He says, oh, you know, we still have them. And I said, oh, really? He says, yeah, we just don't get as much press as they get out in California because we don't get those money shots they like to show on CNN of the water bombers and stuff. But he said, you know, forest fires are still a big problem here in, in Columbus and Brunswick County and stuff like that. So go to the next slide. So this is a work summary. This came out of a, a state uh, thing, and I'm not gonna read through the whole uh, thing. Um, but as you can see, they spent six, over 6,000 man days fighting forest fires, um, 
for the two year period that's covered by this report. Um, 39 miles of truck trails, 31 bridges constructed, the three towers, 55 miles of, of telephone line, and most importantly, one privy. That was actually the privy at the Mako Tower that they, they built out there. Um, go to the next slide. Um, this was the later one. It just shows um, the work that they did. Um, this was a well-documented, the Civilian Conservation Corps you know, not just Camp Sapona, but nationwide, very well documented, uh, the work that was done. The amount of work is just mind boggling when you think about it, when you multiply the work done by this camp times the 4,000 camps that there ultimately were around the United States, the 3.3 million men that served in the Civilian Conservation Corps. And um, I would be willing to bet that there's not anybody uh, in the United States that either knowingly or unknowingly hasn't run across some work that was done um, by members of the Civilian Conservation Corps, even though people don't focus on it a lot today. All right, we'll run through the next couple slides because I see my time's getting to be towards an end. The Sapona Sand Spur, this was the camp newspaper. Um, almost every camp in the United States put out, um, you know, their own camp newspaper uh, of varying quality. Um, all of these are located on um, the Susie Carson Research Room Library. We posted them a couple years ago. So if you'd like to go there and, and look through these no newspapers, um, they're very interesting reading. Uh, these two pictures, I'll just point out, the one on the left is when they were running this newspaper off on a mimeograph machine. Um, right at the end of the camp's life, the state port pilot actually agreed to start publishing the paper for them. And ironically, only one edition went out because they, the camp um, closed on very short notice right about the same time as this last edition of the Sandspur went out. So, but all of those are available on the research room website. I encourage you to go take a look at them. A lot of interesting thing in there. A lot of interesting things to look at in there. Next slide. Um, just some ads uh, that were in the, the earlier paper, um, you know, the Watson Pharmacy, the Ruark Company. Um, you, can go, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, the, go to the next slide, Bob. There you go. The Amusia Theater was a big thing. And, and um, as you can see from the article in the center, um, the Furplaces used to give uh, free passes to, member, to the camp uh, commander who could give them out for like, you know, exemplary awards for best barracks or whatever. And he could give these guys tickets to the movies so they could walk into town and, uh, and go watch a movie in there. So it was a very close relationship, not just because of the close proximity, um, but there was a lot of, of interaction between the town and the camp. Um, again, if you read the camp newspapers, Actually, town, uh, you know, like the town Rotary, for example, would have their, their meetings at the camp because they had the rec hall there, um, things like that. We'll go to the next slide. Um, dances, they used to hold dances periodically. They'd get bands in from Wilmington or Raleigh to come in and play. And, you know, all the, all the town, presumably the guys just wanted the girls to show up, but I'm sure some of the other uh, people did as well. Um, but these were big deals, and they were written up not just uh, in the camp newspaper, but in the state court pilot. And I also found a couple of references in the Wilmington paper to uh, dances that were held, held at Camp Sapona. Go to the next slide. Um, just some other big things that were going on, again, out of the state port pilot. Uh, sports news, um, the boys getting involved in, um, you know, blood donations. They used to have, boxing was very popular. They'd have you know, fight shows going on, um, civic uh, clubs where uh, members of the town were invited to come out to the camp for uh, lectures and things like that. So um, definitely Camp Sapona was a big part of Southport for those three years it was in, in, in uh, business. Next slide. Just some more, um, some more highlights uh, from the paper. Uh, next slide. Okay, so Camp Sapona comes to a close. 
um, I just want to spend just a minute on this uh, to talk about it. And these, this slide and the next slide go together. This is the, the, a copy of the, um, the timeline and the shutdown of uh, Camp Sapona. Camp Sapona, they came, I, I told you before that they came up from Georgia in October of 1934. The camp very happily existed for three years until December 1937. And the decision to shut it down happened incredibly short notice. They were notified that they were going to shut the camp down. And two weeks later, the camp was gone. It was shut down. Um, now, there's a couple reasons for that. Camps opened and closed all the time. Um, you know, it was because the, the work that they were performing was done. Um, you know, maybe the district wanted to consolidate camps and work. So the fact that a camp closed is not that unusual. I found it unusual that they closed with two weeks notice. And if we go to the next slide, uh, Bob, I, I alluded to some of the drama about the camp closing that, um, and this is one of the stickier points. Usually when a camp closed, all those buildings were portable buildings and they would move them to a new location. They literally would disassemble a lot of the buildings and take them to the new site. These buildings were put up on private land and it became this huge cat fight between the town and particularly the owner of the property over who got to keep the buildings. And so this went on for almost a year um, until they sorted it out. And I'm not going to read all this. Um, you can go online. Um, this presentation is also on the, um, on the Susie Carson Research Room um, library if you're interested in the particulars of that. But that's why those buildings were still there in April of 1938, even though the camp had closed five months earlier in December, um, was because there was a, a, a little bit of a headbutting going on over what was going to happen to the camp buildings. So we'll go to the next slide. And then finally, um, you know, as they left, this was, a, this was a quote from the members of the camp expressing their appreciation to all the kind things um, said about them in December when they found out that they were closing. Um, you know, many of the boys are far from home and to hear kind words from strangers help us forget the pangs of homesickness, you know, and wishing the town all the best um, as they departed. And, and when they departed, they just departed. The camp went away. Those enrollees that still had time on their enrollment were sent to other camps. Um, those whose time were done, they just went home. And um, as we'll see, um, a few of them stayed. So let's go to the next slide. Oh, just, I inter injected this. This building used to sit behind the JC building on Fodale Street. I think this was an original camp building, though I could never, um, the town ended up getting three buildings from the camp, and this building really intrigued me. It sat behind the, the, the building on Fodale, and I, it was my understanding. I, used to, I asked everybody I could where it came from. Nobody knew. Nobody knew, but its proximity to the camp, just on the other side of the, um, the cemetery, led me to believe that it was an original camp building. Inexplicably, about two months ago, it disappeared. They tore it down, so it's gone. Um, but that sat there for, you know, years and years and years. Um, go to the next slide. The only other thing that I think was left from the camp, this is a, a snip from the state port pilot from the 80s, um, was the, the concrete head of the sewer system for the camp, which existed there. And this is a picture of three of the gentlemen who stayed in town, came because of the camp and stayed, Homer Sherrill, Mac McGlamory, and uh, Jimmy Ward, that Roger Ward's father. Um, this, is, this thing is not there anymore. I heard that it sunk into the ground uh, sometime late in the 1980s. So um, if you're looking for any relics of Camp Sapona, there are none. There is absolutely nothing that remains of the camp um, in town. This was one of the last things. We'll go to the next slide. And we'll just talk for just a second about some of the men who stayed. I'm not saying this is a 100% comprehensive list of all the guys that came and stayed, but these are some of the better known names. You know, Mac McGlamory, who ran, um, you know, Mac's Cafe down where Oliver's is now, Ivan Ludlam, Homer Sherrill, um, 
Julian Sutherland. That's uh, Mark Sutherland. He used to work for the grounds crew in town. His father, uh, Jimmy Ward. All these guys made, um, you know, married local girls and stayed. And um, I, th I think, based on my research over the years, this is probably an unusual thing. I, I would guarantee you that probably no members of company 2530, my granddad's company who went to Milford, Utah, stayed. But here in Southport, a large number of the guys stayed or were originally from this area. And then I'm going to close this because my, hour, my time's up. Um, just talking for just a second about A.C. Matthews, who is that name. It doesn't matter, Bob. A.C. A. C. Matthews um, was an enrollee at the camp. Um, he was a bit unusual in that he was a college graduate. And he became the educational advisor here in camp. And about two years ago, I got contacted by the UNC herbarium because they were doing some background on this AC Matthews. And did I, and he had been in Camp Sapona. So I did some research on him. And he not only was the educational advisor, but he was also doing, he was a botanist and he was doing uh, botany work. And he would tell the guys when they went out to do this work out in the green swamp or up and up around Orton and stuff to collect plants for him. And then um, if they saw something unusual to bring it back. And so he was actually doing the work. And then after Camp Sampona closed, he went back to school, ended up becoming a, a, um, a professor and stuff. Um, a lot of his early work was done here at Camp Sapona where he enlisted the help of the other enrollees in the camp to collect plant specimens for him. And so um, you can actually go, they, they've credited um, some of the stuff that I've, I've sent them in the background on the UNC Herbarium website. But he was kind of an in interesting guy and, and also a member of the camp. So Scott, do you know? my presentation, I, I apologize for rushing through it, but Bob threatened me if I didn't get done in an hour. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's it. I'd love to hear anybody, if anybody has any comments or questions out there. Um, I would just like to point out two more things before I, I close my mouth and stop talking. One, this presentation or one very close to it, I modified it just a little bit, is on the Susie Carson Research uh, Room uh, data. All of the Camp Sapona newspapers are on there. And as of this morning or shortly, uh, those two pictures uh, that have all the names of the members of the camp will be posted there as well. So I encourage you to go take a look at them. There's a lot of really neat information. And if you want to know anything more about the Civilian Conservation Corps, you can contact me directly, stop me on the street. I will just warn you that it could last a while. We're going to talk about it. So thanks everybody for coming. Thank, thank you, Scott. This is really, again, really, really good. I do have a question about that last slide though. Um, the William Wells, at um, in front of the garrison, there's the remnants of a marine rail that I've heard identified as the as the Wells Marine Marine Rail. Uh, so it would have been repairing boats there. Do you know if that's if that's connected to William Wells? Um, I don't know off the top of my head, Bob, but you know what? We might be able to make that connection somewhere. I didn't include it in the presentation. Um, Susie Carson years ago for some of these gentlemen that, whose names appear on here, she, she put what their background was and where they worked, you know, so Mac ran the cafe and, and, um, um, you know, Ivan Ludlam and Jimmy Ward worked up at Sunny Point and things like that. So there might be some reference to, um, William Wells and, and what he did in town. Okay. I just wanted to, to, to clarify, I will put those uh, rosters up on the uh, Susie Carson Research Room. Uh, I'll get it done by tomorrow, okay? All right. Nothing but disappointment, but okay. <laughs> I mean, we could have put them up any time over the last five years, but, you know, just decided this morning. Any, any other questions? Hey, Scott, can you hear me? I can. Uh, this is John. Good job. I just wanted to uh, make a statement and ask a question. Um, I know as you're backpacking on the Appalachian Trail, there's a handful of shelters that I believe are, were made by the uh, CCC, and the closest one I can think of is Blood Mountain, 
in uh, Georgia. Uh, the question, are there, were there any other camps directly right around here that we would uh, recognize where they would be? So, um, John, you're absolutely right. I've actually, I've, I've actually spent some time over the last couple of years hiking the Appalachian Trail, and I always I have been to that shelter on Blood Mountain, which, by the way, is full of mice. But um, there are lots, there are lots of, of things, and, and there were CCC camps all along the trail, and, and you know, Great Smoky Mountains National Park, I think, had eight camps within the park, and they actually built the Appalachian Trail and stuff like that. So when I hike it, what I'm getting at is I'm always looking for those remnants, whether it be a shelter or an aqueduct or a culvert or something that I know was built by camp. And I try to, you know, try to do some research on it after. To answer your question, though, about local camps, there was the camp here after camp and, and while the camp was in uh, business here, they actually had uh, several spike camps where they would send a small work group out to go spend maybe a month working. They had a spike camp um, in Bolton and they had a spike camp out of Lake Waccamaw. The spike camp in Bolton turned into a permanent camp um, after Camp Sapona closed. So there's no remnants of the camp there but if you go out um, 211 all the way to uh, 7074 you'll pass another tower out there and mm -hmm. that's where there was a camp out there. Um, in fact, there's a road out there called Old CC Road. If you look on the map, um, there was a camp out there. The nearest, um, you know, fully mature camp that I know of is Elizabethtown. There was a camp in Elizabethtown. And in fact, there's a, there's a CCC worker statue up there um, at the, at, um, what is it, Bladen State Park up there? um that you can go and and um they've got some information on the camp that was there but um a lot of the area work was handled by spike camps from camp sapona the ones at waccamaw bolton and elizabethtown are probably the, are the closest camps that i know of thanks mm -hmm. scott i have a quick question this is pat DeBarrow. thanks again for this um in your in your research for this uh for the general purpose of uh, CCC. Did you ever run into um, the idea that uh, some of this was to prepare men for war? So, yeah, and that's kind of, it's, it's kind of an urban myth, to be honest, Pat. Um, from the outset, um, even though the, the camps were run by the War Department, a very conscious effort was made to not make it a militarized organization. Okay, they all wore surplus World War I uniforms, the camps were administered by the War Department, but they never undertook any training or work that was geared towards preparing them for war. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put an asterisk by that and say at the very end of the program, by the time we get to 1941, 1942, I mean, literally the last days of the program, work was done for, they had CCC men doing work, for example, on Fort Bragg. Um, they had some training in things like radio, which had existed before, but it got ramped up a little bit. But you will never see a CCC uh, enrollee carrying a rifle or undertaking marksmanship training or anything like that. It was, it was a big no-no. FDR never wanted that to happen. He didn't want it because there was, a, there was a lot of pushback that they thought that that's exactly what it was going to be. And he did not want that to be the case, that um, people thought that these boys were being sent off to prep them for the military. Now, all that being said, when the war did kick off, you had 3.3 million young men who had been in the Civilian Conservation Corps, had worked in these camps, had learned, you know, to take orders and, and do work and be a mess hall attendant and, and live and work with other people. And did that make them better soldiers? Absolutely. Absolutely. But that was not the intent of the program at any point. Thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm. Scott, was the program controversial? Controversial um, at the time, did people? Did most people support 
the program because people were benefiting from it and putting people to work, or did they see it as socialism? Or when the program was first proposed, um, you know, and despite that quick timeline I gave you earlier, how quickly the law passed, there actually was a lot of pushback on it. Um, you know, labor was very big, especially at a time when a lot of people didn't have jobs. And so there was a lot of pushback from the unions and the, you know, the AFL and the CIO and all these, you know, what are you doing? You're creating this organization where you're going to get all this cheap labor and it's going to put us out of business and guys aren't going to be work. So consciously, um, if you look at that, the law that was signed into act, none of the work was going to compete with private industry in any way. So that's why the work was done on federal land. That's why the work was done on state land. Um, they did not build road. You know, they talk about road building, but as we were talking before this started, they were talking, when they say uh, a CCC road was built, it's a dirt road through the woods. It's not paving, um, you know, 133 at the Wilmington kind of thing, because that, that would be for private industry. Um, now, all that being said, the whole concept of Camp Sapona was that their work was done on private land. That was a very, and this is opening up a whole thing. This was a very canny thing that FDR did. When he had pushback from certain areas, politically or otherwise, he might place a camp there, right? So I don't know the politics of Mr. Orton or Mr. Sprunt, right? But this camp was placed here to do this work to do all these good things, to build the economy here in Southport in the area and get those positive, a positive aspect to that, to turn these people over um, that were perhaps against the CCC program and make them proponents of the CCC program. So he was very canny in that respect. And um, there were P camps, um, P for private, private land camps all over the United States but they were very specifically placed to win over um, communities or specific people. You know, that was a kind of a political play. But, one, but just one more thing, once they happened though, when they closed this camp here, there was a tremendous uproar. The community loved this camp. Um, and it's the same with every camp in every state you know, in the union, when it, wherever there was a camp, if there was pushback at the beginning, by the time the camp had been there for a while, it was just the opposite because they realized the, the money that the camp brought in, the employment that the camp brought in. And um, it, it's probably the most popular government program that was ever run. Interesting. This was very interesting. Thank you. This was well done. And I think this will be out on our Facebook page too, right, Bob? Yes, yes, and there'll be a recording, recording of it. I, I was thinking Scott maybe could use that recording when he starts writing his book about Camp Sapone. <laughs> I don't know if there's enough for a book. Well, a short book. Yeah, coloring book. Maybe one of your coloring books. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I finished my last book the other day, or I, I almost finished it. I only have two more pages to color. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, Scott. It was great. I appreciate we'll try it. to do it again. If anybody has any questions Please. or comments or just wants to talk about the Civilian Conservation Corps, I'm the guy who took a road trip around the United States two years ago and stopped at 87, you know, only slightly exaggerating camps um, across the country. So it's just a passion of mine. And I'm fortunate that I live in center right field of, the, of a camp ball field. Okay, thanks everybody. <laughs>